This is the way it was done for a long, long time. Fleece from a sheep, carded and spun into wool. Wool that would be knit into socks and sweaters and caps and mitts and gloves. Wool that would keep the family warm all winter. An ancient skill, an ancient craft. But to an older generation, spinning was not a craft. It was a routine part of life, like net making and boat building and rug hooking. The little money you earned was too precious to waste on store-bought goods, so you made everything with your own hands. Then times got better. There was more money around. Roads were pushed all over the island, putting an end to isolation. Outport communities like Twillingate began to look ahead to more prosperous times. The homemade, the hand-hewn, suddenly seemed a bit old-fashioned. People here, as in other parts of Newfoundland, threw out their spinning wheels or sold them to American collectors for a song. Some feared the old skills, the old crafts would eventually die, and there's no doubt they did fade for a while. But not anymore. Crafts are beginning to flourish once again on Twillingate Island. And here's one reason why. Tourists, they're coming in droves. Some are fascinated with our churches and old cemeteries. Some come to trace their roots. Some come with their kids to experience outport life and to bring home some pictures. Some like to get out in motorboat and see how a Newfoundland fisherman makes his living. Such scenes are new and different to a person raised in the city or on the prairies. Some come to watch whales. Here she goes. There's her tail. Boat tour operator C. Stockley knows how important tourists are to Twillingate. Tourism is definitely a growing uh, resource market for our community, and, um, and there are a lot of people who are taking advantage of it. People are coming from all over, I suppose. All over. Uh, mentioned, mentioned a country practically now, and I've pretty well seen them in the last few years. And what do they say when they come out on both? Fantastic. Tourists want to see something different. They're fascinated with lighthouses and stand in awe over our magnificent ocean panoramas, which we all take for granted. And icebergs, they love icebergs as much as Newfoundland fishermen hate them. But there's one other thing that tourists like to do, and that's visit a good craft shop. Not to buy trinkets from Hong Kong, but to buy the real thing, handcrafted here in Newfoundland. And that's just what they find here in the Twillingate Museum and Craft Shop. The bus tours come all summer, bringing people from all over North America. People anxious to explore a new part of the world and to bring back home a little part of it. Each year sees an increase in the number of tourists who come to Twillingate. 15,000 passed through the doors of the craft shop last summer. Between June and September, there were some 95 bus tours. Business is booming, and that's just fine for Lorna Stucklis, who's watched over and nurtured this enterprise from the beginning. Ever since I've been here, for 15 years, well, continually getting busier. I see. Mm -hmm. So you've really got a lot of people this summer. Yes. Oh, yes. And they come in, in buses and uh, big groups like that all the time? Uh, yes. There was three on Sunday, one yesterday, and three today, bus groups. So that means there's hundreds of people passing through yes. every day in the summer. Right. Tell me how you got started in this now. Yeah, what Were you always interested in, in this kind of thing, or did you see the great potential Newfoundland had? Well, I was always interested, but uh, since I uh, got involved with Women's Institute, and of course Women's Institute is concerned with uh, bringing back our old traditional crafts and, and uh, in the community, enriching people's lives. And uh, we started with some craft courses in through Women's Institute. And then, of course, the women started making things. And we needed an outlet. And we started this museum. And, and uh, first of all, we had a little room upstairs in the bedroom. And then it just grew and grew. And we had to build on a, sp a place. 
it must give you a lot of satisfaction to give people things that they really appreciate here. I mean, the of people who come really, really like what they see, don't they? Sure, it's not hard to sell a good product. And once you, you do, and the, and, the, and the customer is satisfied, of course, that's the best advertisement that you can get. Four more sweaters, isn't it? <laughs> but how do you make sure you get good things coming in? Because I know the people. And, you know, once they bring in their sweaters and they're all sold, well, you know they must be good, so they keep continually producing it. But things that, that doesn't sell, sell goes back to the producer, and of course, they don't make any more things that don't sell. Tour operator John Nolan well knows the road to Twillingate. He's been coming back again and again and again. Now, John, you've been coming here for quite a while, I believe. Oh, this is my eighth year coming down here, bringing people down to Newfoundland. Yeah. And you yeah. keep coming back to the craft I think, shop? I think it's great. Yeah, this, this particular craft shop, we don't, there aren't so many, actually, for us to get to. And the people are just desperate to get to craft shops and look around, and this is a great treat for them to come here. I Very see. popular to come here to Twillingate. And they do buy things. It is not just a Oh, no, they buy shop. things. I'll tell you by the weight of the coach. When we get back home, we're loaded right down. <laughs> If you don't mind passing on trade secret now, how, uh, how much money could you turn over in a good day here when you have a lot of people coming through? Well, I don't mind at all because today, for instance, we took in $1,500 up to now. You'd think that a place the size of Tullingate would have only one craft shop. But no, there are several others. One is just out the road away, Hallwell's Craft Store. It has different. Inside, Proprietress Audrey Hallwell was in her element, working away at her needlepoint, while a flock of tourists browsed through her store. Oh, that's the. Um, oh, isn't that a door? Is that the iceberg? That's an iceberg that's taken from the the, the bridge between the two islands. Oh, look at the size of it! One yeah. summer, a few years ago, they were around all summer. Yeah, I bet we did see one. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? No, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> Does this belong to anything? I hope I can see a little tiny. Yes, it belongs to the, to the mouse. The mouse, excuse me. I can oh, see a little tiny. The mouse one. doorstop. Yes. Oh, it right just, here. Yeah, just. It's oh. not attached or anything, you know. It's just. Oh, all right. <laughs> and people kept pouring in. It was hard to believe I was oh, in Twillingate. Okay. Tourists were rare here 10 or 15 years ago. Now they're as thick as flies. You're quite busy here today, I believe, Audrey. Yes. Is it always like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite truthful, it isn't. Yeah. But uh, this is how it seems to go. You know, they come in droves, and then there's a break in between. So that's okay too. I can do my housework and so on. Yeah. You do a lot of embroidery, I believe, for you, Audrey. Uh, embroidery. Uh, sewing, crocheting, needlepoint. I I don't want to be tied to any one thing because I get bored. So when you do a lot of different things, uh, time flies and you don't get bored and it's more interesting. And everything sells, does it, to the right yeah. tourists? Right. Mm -hmm. Does so. Do you pretty well sell everything now you make in the winter time, or is that is that how it goes? You work in the winter and sell it in the summer? <laughs> that, but I also have to work throughout the summer. Mm. So you can't, you know, you can't supply enough with your winter's work. So even while you're serving the, the visitors, you're, oh, yeah. you're working? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and so we left Audrey at her needle point to move across Twillingate Harbor to the home of Goldie Stockley, who took first prize in the crafts competition last year. Goldie knits for the craft shop. There are others who operate independently. There's no doubt the craft industry is alive and well in Twillingate. Yes, there is quite a few and more, more each year coming in, getting, getting crafts. Does it mean much to, <clears throat> in terms of making Yes, money? it do. It, 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 it's a means where, whereby we would not get the extra dollars that we get for it if it wasn't for the museum craft shop. So it's, it's far more than just, just a hobby, just a, a pastime? Uh, yes, really it is. And uh, right now it's a supplement to my husband's income. So, you know, and I enjoy doing it <laughs> as well. Some people figured this, this would disappear. I mean, it was, it was on the way out, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. Knitting has really come back in this last 
seven or eight years anyway, stronger than it was. It really was dying out. I had to return to the craft shop for another look at something that had intrigued me earlier. It was still there, a little comatic made of brass. Who made it? And what was its story? Lorna would know for sure. There's a good chance I'm about to part with some money. Where did that come from? Oh, this is a, a miniature comatic made by uh, Uncle Jack Budgel. Uncle Jack is from originally from uh, Exploits, and now lives in Lewisport. He's now 92 years old. 92. Yes. Oh. And, and what does he make it out of? What is that brass? Or? It's brass, and it's made. It's all sawn from the old shaft of his motorboat. And he made it by hand. Incredible. On, on the back, I, I a comatic made by a 92-year-old man the from the shaft of his motorboat. Lorna had me hooked. I bought the comatic and resolved to go to Lewisport the next day to meet Uncle Jack Budgel and find out more about this little brass sled. I'm sure you'll love that. Back in a little while, and we'll move on to Lewisport. This is Lewisport, home of 92-year-old Uncle Jack Budgel, who once carried the mail from here to Exploits Island by dog team and punt. He's the man who made my comedy from the shaft of his motorboat. I rummaged around till I found it. That's it there. Yeah, that's it there. You saw it up in so many quarters. And that is sound with a whole saw. Tell me about the comedy. Now, I suppose you used to have one of these yourself, did you? I had one 16 feet long. Yeah. Nice sharp point, huh? Like that. Down around here and up around the footprints. Put the mail in there. We go by our side. Put the dogs out there on bad ice. They go in the water. She uh, everything go down to the punt. We jump in the punt. We hook in the dogs, all of me, the gaff like that. All of me. Wouldn't I worry hook it in the skin or in the in the <laughs> ants? All the harnesses is done with rope and done all with flannel. Hey. So you carry the mail now all I year? I carried the mail for 22 winters from this lousy place down to lousy exploits. <laughs> in the water and out the water. I didn't mind falling in the water then no more than I do getting, not so much getting it back now. <laughs> I had some hard thing, times carrying the mail, but a uh, lot of it our own fault. A lot of our own fault, win. I suppose every time you make one now, you, you think back to those days, do you? I come in on, I've come up along the south pond on ice, on ice, one step, go on through, one step, go on through. But that's salt water ice, a buckle. Fresh water ice, a crack, you go down. See? It's cracky, like a piece of chalk. Fresh water ice is. But now salt a buckle, see? And that comedy had carried a punk and about 10 bags of mail and our kitchen bag. Well, our kitchen bag was our food. Over what you'd have put rackets on to walk over. Young hot ice. Cause she was 16 feet, I had a two, two and a half inch brass shoe, 12 feet long on it, brass. She'd hardly stay still on the level. Huh. How many dogs would you have? Uh, six or seven. And they all had a place in that punt to go. Now, uh, the old dog I had, he go up under the bow thought where I wouldn't tread on his paws. <laughs> and the other fellow would have two dig it in the deal under his thought. Yeah. And the other two you had to get here where I'd straighten up my feet. Well, I'd straighten it around when I could. And more times I didn't mind where my foot would go. Oh. And uh, one time we went to Swan Arbor, and off Cowhead there, the slab was in, and we had our boat and only just managed manager in the slab. So all you had to do is shuffle in the stern of the boat and say hi aboard, and they come board, knock you overboard almost, my dogs. Why you take the time to make all this now? It's not for the money, is it? 
Well, sir, they just passed away my lonely hours. If I wasn't at this, I might be walking the street tormenting women. <laughs> Do you do much knitting, Mrs. Budgel? Yeah, I do a lot. Got a lot down to trying to get. Well, how long does it take to knit a pair of mitts, though? Oh, I knit a pair of mitts, sit them by after supper, and I'll finish them perhaps before I go to bed. If I don't go to bed until I pass 12 or 1, I'll finish them. Did you do that all your life now, or is that something you just took off? Oh, I knit all my lifetime. There's not big enough knit. I suppose way back people had to do it, didn't they? Right, they had to do it. Then they used to do it for the for St. Anthony Mission to make a bit of money. Yeah. I suppose somebody now with a big family, but the, the the woman, the women will be really busy knitting all the oh, time. Oh yes, knitting all the oh, time. Oh, the knit sweaters. Uh, one time you get a man to have a pair of um, knit drawers, long drawers. Now the stippings. <laughs> For sharks, my God. Miss Budgel, do you knit the trigger mitts now with the one finger? Is that? Oh yes. That's yep. still popular, is it? This is mitts with the finger and thumb, see? But with the other finger, it causes them thumb cuttings. Yeah. Just the finger and thumb, see? Now this is this she is knits. this is gloves, see? Oh yeah. It's gloves, see? And that's gloves, huh? See, and that's socks. I suppose you make a good bit, bit of money at that, do you? I can't tell you that because my pension be cut. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may, you make a bit of money at it, you know. Not all craftspeople work at home. In response to a growing demand, some have developed into fully fledged businesses. These looms weave a distinctive fabric that is fashioned into stylish sweaters. It's a product that sells well all across Canada. Five craftspeople work here for 10 months of the year, with other home knitters supplying the cuffs and waistbands. Barbara Roberts told me about Bogside Weaving. Well, Bogside Weaving is a production studio, pro weaving hand-woven sweaters. That's, that's how we sort of classify ourselves. And we say a production studio because we don't make one sweater at a time, we weave a bolt of fabric and the sweaters are cut and sewn from that. Could you tell me exactly what happens here now step by step? Okay, well I'll take you through the process as well as I can now. We start with a skein of wool, a hank of wool in the olden days it was called. We start with skeins of wool and ball it into balls and from that we make a warp. The fabric, woven fabric is made up of warp and weft and we're starting here with the warp. Each thread is measured out a certain length and we need a certain amount of threads. That's the design of the fabric. This, this is the warp being made 24 yards long. So each turn of the mill gives you four yards. So we turn it six times, we've got 24 yards. And, and we count the number of threads that goes on. The number of threads that goes on is determined by the width of your fabric and how many threads per inch. From the warping mill, we take the warp and it gets threaded through the reed and through the heddles and tied on the back of the loom and is then wound on. Once your warp is wound on the back of your loom, you tie it on the front and you have your threads from front to back. and by operating the loom, raising threads and lowering threads, this is very simplifying the process, you then throw your, your shuttle across and you've got your weft, your warp and your weft make your fabric. A machine is not doing it, a person is doing it and each thread is thrown individually and that person has to be very skilled to do that. Um, as a craftsperson. You have to be very good with your hands. Your feet and your hands are coordinated. Um, so you have, to, you have to have the feel of a craftsperson. From the bolt of fabric, we cut each sweater individually. And it's sewn up. Um, we have two seamstresses, each work with industrial sewing machines. And they're trained here. We, we hire people who have some sewing skills, but 
basically we train them because each sweater has to be woven exactly the same. It has to be sewn exactly the same so that we have a uniform product. Barbara, tell me about the finished product. I believe you've got one of them on now. The jacket I'm wearing, Dave, is, is what we've, the finished product that we've made from the fabric you actually saw being made with the stripes. This, our bog jacket, is one of our best sellers. That's the bog jacket. This is the bog jacket. And also the color. It's a very, very good color for us. It's the blue heather color, and people love it because it's got lots of colors and so on in it. Um, we started making this, one of our original products, around 1980, 81, 82. We started in 1980. And from here, we started making, got more and more into clothing, because when I first started, it was just a few scarves and rugs and so on. So we got more and more into clothing and have gone from the jackets to the sweaters. Could we see a sweater too? These are the sweaters. Again, blue heather in the sweaters. This is a, uh, our best seller because it probably because it looks more like a sweater. It's got a shape sleeve. It's good for men and women. Teenagers wear them and older women wear them because they're such a classic design. They suit everybody. Um, and it's they're very good, warm, long-wearing sweater. Every year, there's more and more craftspeople becoming more professional, becoming business people, and learning how to make a product that's um, feasible to make, uh, still a good product, and be able to make a dollar from it. And so, sweaters and other crafts designed and created in Newfoundland find a ready market in the trade and craft fairs of the nation. People flock to these shows to see, to buy. Interest is steadily climbing. For the right product, there's money to be made. Ironic, isn't it? Handcrafted products, once scorned as symbols of an older, humbler subsistence way of life, are now valued and cherished in fashionable circles as works of art. And why shouldn't they be? For each is an original creation. Each reflects the skill, the passion, the pride of the person who made it. And each, in its own way, reflects our culture, our heritage. I've watched people late in the fall on the coast of Labrador gather the wild saltwater grass. I've watched them create beautiful baskets from this grass, an ancient native custom that winds back through the mists of time. Closer to home, I've heard Uncle Jack Budgel's stories too, of boats and dogs and cometics and carrying the mail. This too is part of our story as a people. So like a lot of people, I suppose I'm beginning to understand why there's such a growing interest in crafts and products that are carefully, lovingly made by hand, and why the craft shop in Twillingate is doing so well. Lorna Stucklis has never took a backward slide from the first year we started, which is 15 years ago, even longer. Uh, it's never gone back. It's always growing continually. The craft industry, growing fast, a clean industry, an industry that spreads money around where it's most needed, an industry that gives us both creative satisfaction and pride in our cultural heritage. This program is for Uncle Jack Budgel, who died on January the 2nd of this year.